Hello, everybody. We're going to start a little early uh, to give uh, plenty of time for our speaker and for some questions. So please continue to finish your meals. Um, welcome to our club luncheon. Thank you all for attending. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm the FCC president. Uh, before formally introducing our guest, Siwai Lung, I'd like to thank him and all of you on behalf of the finance and the food and beverage committees for helping us achieve our year-end revenue targets. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is not why we invited him, but it's a nice bonus. <laughs> uh, a few reminders first. Please make sure your mobile phones are turned to silent mode. We are live streaming this event and showing it via audio and video elsewhere in the club, so please keep background noise to a minimum if you could. Please remain respectful of our guest and of those asking questions. We'll have time for a few, some questions afterward. I will moderate the Q&A. Um, there'll be microphones that come around. When we get to that point, please identify yourself and give your affiliation when you ask a question. This is an important day for the FCC. We are very pleased that the former chief executive has accepted our invitation to speak here. The fact that we extended the invitation and he accepted it showcases the role the FCC can play and does play in advancing discussion of important topics in Hong Kong from a range of speakers. As most of you are aware, the former chief executive has in the past been highly critical of this club, notably because of our choice of a past speaker. The fact that we're all together today showcases why it is so important to uphold freedom of speech and freedom of the press uh, that is written into Hong Kong law. We need to hear from each other and we need to keep the lines of communication open. The Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong is pleased to be a forum for such discussions and we hope to continue in that role for many, many years to come. Now for my introduction of Si Wai Long. He's going to speak on China, 70 years, and my vision for the future. As China celebrates 70 years since the founding of the People's Republic, our speaker will reflect on the achievements of the nation and his vision for the future of China. Our speaker was appointed vice chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in March 2017. He served, as all of you know, as the third chief executive of Hong Kong between 2012 and 2017. He was pre previously convener of the Executive Council of Hong Kong and secretary general of the Hong Kong Basic Law Consultative Committee. Again, we're pleased to be able to host the former chief executive. I give you Si Wai Long. Ms. Schneider, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation. When I was a student in England, I came across this book, Key Treaties for the Great Powers, 1814 to 1914. It was a catalog of extraordinary humiliation for China. As a school student in Hong Kong, I had learned about some of these treaties, but had never read the full text. So I decided to own them, spending about six hours worth of wages as a part-time helper in a Chinese fish and chip shop. The owner of the shop, a Mr. Li, was from Zhongshan of Guangdong province. The Chinese people like to ask each other, not their place of origin, but where their origin was. In Cantonese, Hong Ha Hai Bindo. And in Putonghua, Lao Jia Zhan Nali. In Cantonese, Hong Ha Hai Bindo. In Putonghua, Lao Jia Zhan Nali. For me, Lao Jia was Wei Hai Wei in Shandong, a small town built around a naval base in the Qing Dynasty near the tip of the Shandong Peninsula. My parents came to Hong Kong from Wei Hai Wei when they were teenagers. My father to work in the Hong Kong police. We lived in police merit quarters. Five doors away from our cubicle was another Shandong policeman working for the special branch. Wei Hai Wei was featured in two tre treaties in the book. The Treaty of Shinoseki with Japan in 1895, under which Japan was allowed temporary occupation as a guarantee 
of faithful performance of the stipulations of this Act, which included a war indemnity of 200 million Kuping tails. And the second, the convention between Great Britain and China respecting Wei Hai Wei, which was signed on the 1st of July, 1898, the very day when the lease over the new territories of Hong Kong commenced. The British had been busy. The Qing Dynasty ended in 1911, soon after these treaties. My father was born in that year. Nationalist rule lasted only 38 years, not long after the Japanese invasion. My mother, for whom I have great admiration, was born after the end of the Qing Dynasty. But the old custom of binding the feet of young girls had persisted. The nationalist government sent inspectors to try to stop this cruel practice. They were chased away by the locals. The majority of the people were in favor still of this old custom. And so my mother had her feet bound 15 years after the end of the Qing Dynasty. And the majority were wrong, very wrong. Then the People's Republic was founded in 1949, the year when my older sister was born. As for me, I was born in 1954, which in the traditional 60-year cycle was a year of Jia Wu. The previous Jia Wu being 1894, widely known for the war with Japan, as a result of which China signed or made to sign the Treaty of Shimonoseki and lost Taiwan. My family was typical. Every member owning a personal piece of Chinese history. Our generation did not need to be told what to do being Chinese. History is a line and not scattered dots. I'm giving you a rather long but only a small part of China's modern history for two purposes. First, to set the background leading to the founding of the People's Republic 70 years ago. And secondly, to remind all of us the, the historical context in which China and its people lived the past and how they view the future. We want to be able to focus on the advancement of the country. We do not need reprisals. But this question often comes to mind. What if the treaties in my book had never forced their ways into Chinese history? The early years of the People's Republic were not easy. Shenzhen was the first place on the mainland that I visited. It was 1977, 28 years into the People's Republic, also the year before the reforms were launched. The population was probably 20,000, with no motor vehicles. Now Shenzhen, as you know, is a city on the mainland that has the highest GDP, GDP per capita. I brought a loaf of bread from Hong Kong with me for lunch because I did not have food coupons. For many years since 1978, I went there again to teach when I was given food coupons. In 1979, I took a long and slow train ride from Beijing to Shanxi. The scenes outside the windows were unflatteringly gray, barren, and depressing. It might just be my imagination, but I thought I saw the scars of war and political turmoil. Nationwide reforms were launched in 1978, 29 years after the founding of the People's Republic. So the past 70 years are made up of 29 years of planned economy and 41 years of market economy. Many in the middle-aged generation in China now have no personal experience of the planned economy and the food coupons. By now, there have been too many reforms to recount. To me, the 1988 land and housing reforms were the most exciting. China now, has the largest real estate market in the world, 
which has attracted most or much outside investments and all the major foreign professional consultancies. Land sales have become a major source of government revenue and real estate, a major asset for private individuals, families, and corporates. Often, we overlook the fact that it only took China the short span of 31 years for all these to happen. When I started working as a pro bono advisor to the Shanghai government in the 1980s and helped draft the first land sale document of the People's Republic in 1988, no one expected this new reform initiative to take hold and spread as quickly as it has. <clears throat> I brought with me this book, which is a record of the efforts leading to the sale of the first piece of land in March 1988 by Tender, and I had in it. So I thought you might be interested as a journalist and I leave behind a copy, uh, Jody, if I may. Uh, you mentioned to me the fact that you give me a, a gift at the end. I'll exchange this with you. <laughs> the housing reform that was started in the same year, again, it was 1988, was equally impactful and far-reaching. The mainland now has a higher owner occupation rate than Hong Kong's. Housing space per head is twice that in Hong Kong. How could one reconcile these with the socialist doctrine of state land ownership? The answer is, I suppose, we did it in a typically Chinese pragmatic way. With handsome land revenue from land sales, local governments have been able to rebuild cities and the countryside. Way high which my parents were told to leave when they were teenagers for Hong Kong because there was not enough food on the table. It's now a very livable seaside city. I proudly invite you to visit this Laojia of mine. Or perhaps Country Life could start a way high edition. Achievements in the past 70 years are plentiful. I shall not use the well-known GDP growth figures. Let us look at the people-to-people -people interactions. The country is now much more open, both way. In 2018, 71 million, or 5% of the mainland Chinese population visited foreign countries. And this is not counting those coming to Hong Kong, going to Macau and Taiwan. So 5% of the mainland Chinese population last year who visited foreign countries. In the same year, 662,000 mainland Chinese students were studying overseas. 662,000. <clears> the meaning of these figures is, of course, much more than bringing revenue to the tourism and education sectors. And then by way of humanitarian aid, since 1963, 280 million patients in 71 countries have been treated by Chinese medical teams. On the political side, there are also plenty of notable achievements, the latest being the decisions of the fourth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party in October, Sizhong Chenhui. In the previous month, the first central conference in the 70-year history of the CPPCC was held Presidency emphasized the role of the CPPCC, I quote, as a major political and organizational body for implementing the new model of political party system. And who says there's no reform in the political system in China? As a major political and organizational, organizational body for implementing the new model of political party system. These major political events have been underreported by the Western media, partly, I suppose, because of the absence of English texts. And anyway, they are extremely difficult, believe me, to translate. In the past few years, the CPPCC has been reviewing its role in the Chinese political system. And this is how I see it. China has a multi-party system, non-adversarial and not plebiscitary. 
the CPPCC is the dedicated body for consensus building. 60% of the members of the National Committee are not Communist Party members. Regularly, group meetings are held to discuss in-depth topical issues such as the environment, the shared economy, healthcare, and poverty elimination. The meetings are attended by members, outside experts, stakeholders, and high-ranking officials. There is no grandstanding, no filibustering, or heated arguments. <coughs> Not dramatic to watch, but it achieves the objective of finding solutions that are acceptable to most to move forward. The future of China and the visions covering the full range of subjects from deepening reforms and opening up poverty elimination, scientific and technological developments to the respective roles of the state-owned and private enterprises have been well discussed internally within the Communist Party, the CPPCC, and the populace. China watchers in the West have a lot of catching up to do. I have my own wish list. I wish we could facilitate more young people from other countries to experience China for them to form their own views. Achievement is one thing. Being recognized by the international community to have achieved is another. Throughout the past 70 years, China has been at the receiving end of numerous uninvited and mostly unwarranted criticisms from the West on issues that do not touch on bilateral relationships. Some of these have become China bashing. These commentators believe that they are better and know enough about China and its past. Please don't take offense. As someone who knows a tiny bit about the West, after all these years, it is still beyond me as to why people in the West make it a habit of opening their mouths about other countries as if they had done better dealing with their own domestic problems. Hong Kong has been an easy proxy and a soft target of China. It has been drafted by the West to join the ranks of Xinjiang and Tibet. China has been constantly, constantly told what democracy, the freedoms, and human rights should mean <coughs> under, <coughs> under the principle of one country, two systems. Somehow these commentators never bothered other places in Asia about the same democracy, human rights, and freedom issues with the same yardsticks. Would this be because these other places are not part of China? At exactly midpoint in the 70 year history of the People's Republic, namely 1984, China and the United Kingdom signed a joint declaration on the question of Hong Kong. This was historic, the first step towards the goal of complete reunification of China. The adoption of the one country, two systems principle to re reunite the country is by no means expedient. Indeed, in the decisions of the fourth plenary session, of the 19th Central Committee meeting, which I mentioned, one country, two systems is regarded officially as one of the systemic advantages that China enjoys. I do not expect and do not see the need to move away from the one country, two systems principle after 2047. Provided the Democrats in Hong Kong and their Western supporters do not undermine it. We may take note of the fact that already Hong Kong has been allowed to grant land leases well beyond 2047. Those granted this year have 2069 as the expiry dates. In my numerous, meeting, <coughs> in my numerous meetings with Beijing and other mainland officials in the full course of the transition from 1984 to 1997, one thing was obvious. The return of Hong Kong was not just about adding back a thousand square kilometers of land to the Chinese territory. It was the beginning of an end to more than a century of humiliation. The preamble to the basic law carries these words in the very first paragraph. I quote, Hong Kong has been 
part of the territory of China since ancient times. It was occupied by Britain after the Opium War in 1840. On 19th December 1984, the Chinese and British government signed a joint declaration on the question of Hong Kong, affirming that the government of the People's Republic of China will resume the exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong with effect from 1st July 1997, thus fulfilling the long-cherished common aspiration of the Chinese people for the recovery of Hong Kong." Unquote. When cities such as Shanghai, which carry the heavy financial burden of supporting the country, were consulted on the basic law drafts, and I was there, they endorsed it unreservedly, despite the exemption of Hong Kong from contributing to the central government coffers. Hong Kong is useful to China in many ways, but I quote again, the long-cherished common aspiration of the Chinese people for the recovery of Hong Kong, unquote, is overriding. Some of the speakers at previous FCC luncheons may reflect on this. Hong Kong returned to China with a very special political structure and an equally special electoral process. Too often, the Democrats in Hong Kong look to models in other countries without regard to the fact that Hong Kong is not a country. If we want to look for parallels, we should be looking to other local democracies such as London, New York, Paris or Tokyo. These cities have universal suffrage and the central or federal governments do not have any role in the appointment of the elected mayor. But these elected mayors have very limited powers compared to the chief executive of Hong Kong. I'm certain that if the Hong Kong chief executive only had limited powers co comparable to those of the above mentioned mayors, Beijing, would straight away give Hong Kong the green light to go ahead with universal suffrage without its involvement. In reality, Beijing has reserved powers under the basic law in the sele selection of the chief executive, whatever the method of the election. And the reason is simple. The chief executive of Hong Kong has to have the additional mandate of the central government through the appointment process to attain the additional power for Hong Kong to have the higher degree of autonomy, higher than cities in other democratic countries. That Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy is well rehearsed. The high degree of, not the full autonomy, can be found in many of the 160 articles of the Basic Law, by which the central authorities and not just the central government, which is just one of the authorities, have reserved unto themselves powers that have not been given to Hong Kong. As an example, the National People's Congress reserves the authority to approve any amendment of the method of selecting the chief executive. This is an example and also an important point on its own. Anson Chan was wrong, patently wrong, when she said in her speech on 2nd July 2014 to the FCC standing here that on the question of universal suffrage, and I quote her, Beijing has moved the goalposts, unquote. She went on record to have said, I quote, if you look at Annex 1 of the Basic Law, Annex 1 says if there's a need to amend the arrangements for electing chief executive in 2017 or in 2007, at that time, past 2007, then it has to obtain the endorsement of two-thirds of electrical members, secure the approval of the chief executive, and be reported to the MPC. Notice, she said, reported. No mention that we have to seek the approval of the central government, unquote. And the quotes are verbatim. Let me now read out the actual wording of paragraph 7 of Annex 1 to the Basic Law. And you might Google it. It's available in both languages on the website. I quote, 
If there's a need to amend the method for selecting chief executives for the terms subsequent to the year 2007, such amendments must be made with the endorsement of a two-thirds majority of all members of Legislative Council and the consent of the chief executive, and they shall be reported to the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress for approval, period, unquote. I find it extremely puzzling as to how Ensign Chan could have dropped the words for approval in a prepared speech to accuse Beijing of moving the goalposts and how she was not corrected by the audience. Of course, much of Hong Kong was misled. Ensign Chan wasn't alone. Speaker Nancy Pelosi was also wrong on the autonomy point when she said on 21st November this year at the Bill and Roman ceremony that, I quote, sadly, without question, China's promise of full autonomy for Hong Kong has been utterly broken. For years, the world has seen the people of Hong Kong be increasingly denied their full autonomy and faced with a cruel crackdown of their freedom, unquote. That's what she said on the 21st of November. Only last month, on the 15th of October, when she delivered remarks on the floor of the House of Representatives, she said, I quote, in 1984, before the United Kingdom transferred Hong Kong to China, the Chinese government promised a high degree of autonomy for the territory in a joint declaration of the question of Hong Kong, unquote. So she said, full autonomy recently, and the previous month, she said, a high degree of autonomy. So China's guilty. On the other side of the Atlantic, <clears throat> on 17 November 2019, Baroness Bennett of the United Kingdom, co-chair of the Westminster Friends of Hong Kong, weighed in. She tweeted the following, I quote, the chief executive has control over lethal force that is being directed at demonstrators who are seeking the right to democracy and self-determination that they are supposed to be guaranteed by the Joint Declaration. The Joint Declaration did not guarantee self-determination. As for democracy, the Joint Declaration says the chief executive will be appointed by the Central People's Government on the basis of the results of elections or consultations to be held locally, unquote. So even if we were to have consultations instead of elections, it would not be in breach of the Joint Declaration. And we can comfortably believe that the United Kingdom signed the Joint Declaration with their eyes open. The follies of the Democrats in Hong Kong and their Western allies have made consultation as a method of selecting chief executives more likely. The outstanding achievements of Hong Kong in the peaceful recoveries, sorry, the outstanding achievements of China in the peaceful recoveries of Hong Kong and Macau under the one country, two systems principle, allowing the people of the two SARs to retain their lifestyles and at the same time protecting foreign investments is now being distorted in a different light. China breaking its promises on full autonomy and self-determination. And China is threatening the freedoms, the rights of the residents. Let's go back to the democratic arrangements for Hong Kong. We could have a process that does not involve Beijing, and that will produce a chief executive who has powers similar to a mayor's. Or we could have the process that is prescribed in the basic law that gives Hong Kong the high degree of autonomy, but with Beijing exercising its authority. If we want, so to speak, to have our cake and eat it, 
by changing to universal suffrage as a method of producing the chief executive elect without, without Beijing's approval, or electing and then installing the chief executive without giving Beijing the right not to appoint. That, for all intent and purposes, is cessation. The Umbrella Movement in 2014 wanted exactly that. They wanted Beijing out of the process. Now, the last of the five demands of the black-clad movement is a repeat of the same. Some Democrats have been trying to force Beijing's hand. The radicals among them want to provoke Beijing to the extent that Beijing reactions will be regarded as failure of the one country, two systems arrangement. An American living in Hong Kong recently wrote to his congressman, I quote from one of his letters, the world is not seeing the truth of Hong Kong. And you're only perpetuating that lie, he's telling his congressman. It is seeing a facade of half-truths created by one nation with the sole intent of undermining another nation, hoping to curtail the continued emergence of that nation on the world stage. The world is seeing a singular view of Hong Kong events from the lenses of those who wish to destroy its parent, where the only possible outcome is to completely sacrifice the child. In another letter, he said, I quote, if you don't understand something, don't weigh in, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, China has come a long way from the days of foreign aggression, public humiliation, foreign partition, famines, poverty, and the so-called bamboo curtain. We should all see China for what it is. It is now open, confident, fast-changing, and integrating with other parts of the world. It is also a vast country steeped in culture and custom. I'm proud to be Chinese, and I'm thankful for having the opportunities to serve my country. I invite you to visit and see for yourself and feel for yourself. The high-speed train station, by the way, is less than half an hour away from this club. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Um, we will now take some questions, and I will take the President's prerogative and ask the first one. Um, and when people ask questions, please identify yourself and your um, affiliation. So what do you think needs to happen in Hong Kong now, uh, especially given the remarkable 71% turnout at the polls this past weekend, uh, more than 3 million people voting, 85% of the seats going to pro-democracy candidates? You mentioned in your remarks a reform. Isn't this a reform referendum? And if so, doesn't it make sense for the government to do something here, uh, for instance, to agree to the independent inquiry that has wide support um, in many sectors in Hong Kong? The, the first past the post um, and single vote, single seat constituency system has resulted in massive loss um, on the part of um, the pro-establishment camp in the uh, district council election. But if you look at the, um, someone's copying his, her years, um, it's the single seat, single vote, and first past the post uh, electoral uh, system in our district council elections that has resulted in this massive loss in the number of seats that used to be uh, occupied by, um, by pro establishment camp. But if you look at the split of the votes cast on last Sunday, it's less than 6% of the votes that went to if like the Democrats, and more than 40% went to the pro-establishment camp. And they actually did better than the electoral election uh, three years ago. Um, the district council election has now become uh, highly political. 
and people vote according to the stance, the political stance of the candidates and not the local community issues. So that's, um, that, that's one thing. So let's not, let's, let's not I'm, I'm not suggesting that you did, um, let's not exaggerate the gain of the Democrats in this uh, election. Um, we now know the results, but we don't know the consequences. And that's the message I want to leave with um, you ladies and gentlemen and leave with um, the rest of Hong Kong. We know the results, we do not know the consequences. The consequences might be far greater than we can ever imagine. Um, the stakeholders, not all the stakeholders have, uh, have reacted. Uh, to some it's come as a shock. I just hope, I just hope that the Democrats and the radical elements in the, Dem the Democrats' camp have not bitten off more of their tanker chew. Okay, okay now, um, uh, microphones are coming around, um, so if people would like to ask questions. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Richard McCauley with Bloomberg News. You said it was, uh, came to a few people as a bit of a shock the result, uh, should it have been, should we expect fewer surprises? Didn't surprise me. It did not surprise me, but, but it's, it's a fact that it surprised um, a number of people, include, including key uh, people in Hong Kong. So, so I, I think um, we're not seeing the end of this. As, as I said, we, we, we know the results, we know how this votes are split, um, but we don't know the, the, uh, the consequences. If you look, look at one of the, um, the key stakeholders in this game, namely the Democrats, who are now um, joined in the hips with the radicals. And there are quite a few radicals who uh, won uh, simply on an anti-government, anti-establishment uh, ticket uh, last Sunday. Um, they have been pretty off the, uh, quick off the feet they are going to um, the Polyu campus, uh, for example. I think they've been emboldened. Um, they'll raise the game. Um, they'll probably repeat a lot of demands, um, claiming that they represent 70-something um, 70 some, 70 something or 70-something percent of the, uh, of the seats. Um, so we'll wait and see. Um, I wish um, uh, Hong Kong well. Um, but I think we, um, we should watch over the consequences of this. Okay. Um, is there a question over here in the corner? I see you, I just Paul Zimmerman. Um, we've known each other for quite some time. Um, two uh, issues, one, one that you raised, um, you expressed that China is confident. Um, and as a Chinese national myself, I'm of course proud to see how successful China is in developing its economy and taking many people out of poverty. However, China is not that confident. I mean, freedom of religion, freedom of um, association, freedom of expression, if one was really confident, why would those freedoms be curtailed and continue to be curtailed? And that's my first question. My second question is, you know, you're a senior statesman, you've, you've achieved a lot, you've run Hong Kong, you're now part of the CPCC. Um, why be so vindictive? Why act as a leader of the minority today? Why send out an email to all people of Hong Kong or to all your friends suggesting that China will turn off the water and the sugar and that the economy will decline and that the atmosphere in each district will sharply decline? Why make those suggestions in your emails? Why rally your troops to fight rather than find consensus and a positive, constructive way forward? I know it's probably not the first time when my name was um, used in um, certain expressions of uh, opinions. But where did you see that email, Paul? I never, I never wrote that email. Fat check. <laughs> Paul, seriously, Paul? You're a politician, fact check. It's not the first time, but please, fact check. Um, secondly, on the question of freedom, um, there is no absolute freedom in any country in the world. And compare what China has done by way of advancing its freedom and the liberties of the people 
um, to the situation, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years ago, 70 years ago. Um, I think China's been doing well. I'm not saying that China's a perfect country in these quarters, but I think China's been making a lot of advances that people are prepared to give China credit for. Uh, question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Liu Qinming, uh, Associate Governor of the Board. Welcome back to our club. When you were last speaking here in 2012, I was also here. Um, you talk about something uh, uh, which I don't think lots of people have been talking about recently, but you mentioned the importance of Loi Gao internal diplomacy between Hong Kong and China. In light of the events which has been happening in Hong Kong, how would you suggest uh, we try to engage uh, this Loi Gao uh, under current circumstances, which I think is badly needed? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim Ming. Um, just to um, give our friends in the audience a bit of um, background, Nei Jiao is a um, it's transliteration of the two characters that form a term, which I coined um, probably 20, 20 something years ago when um, uh, Hong Kong was transitioning uh, into an SLO uh, to mean internal diplomacy versus Wai Jiao, meaning the foreign affairs diplomacy. Um, because within the one country, uh, between the sy two systems, a lot of the dealings and handlings and relations are actually similar to those between two countries. And this is the interesting thing about one country, two systems. It's not one country, one, one system. It's not two countries, two systems either. And so I coined it, this, this, this term. It's, it's something that I think we need to de develop and when we are not paying enough attention to. Um, there's no expert around. I, I, I'm not because it's a 22-year-old uh, thing. Um, in the book, uh, China experiences in China, uh, written by Sir Percy Craddock, a seasoned uh, British diplomat. He was a foreign affairs advisor to two British prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher and then John Major. Um, and it was an old China hand. He led the British team in the, in the negotiations on Hong Kong's future between 1982 and 84. And then in the 1990s, he led the British team again to negotiate with the Chinese side on the new airport and related projects. In his book, he, he said this. He said in diplomacy, he said this is the f first principle of uh, uh, is credit's first principle of diplomacy. In diplomacy, it's not the other side to worry about. It's your home side. Um, he had plenty of experience in that uh, area because he, he was uh, frequently criticized by his home side for being too soft with Beijing in the, nego in the negotiations. So Kim Ming, the first thing that comes to mind is that in Nei Jiao, internal diplomacy, we have the same problems. In internal diplomacy, your problem is not the other side. For us, it's Beijing. It's your home side. People accuse you of all sorts of things. When you're in Beijing, you're often told by Beijing officials and say, you go back to Hong Kong and tell Hong Kong people this. While you're in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong people say, you go to Beijing and tell Beijing this. And, yeah, on the veranda. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Go ahead. Just quickly, I'll uh, wrap this up. The forces in Hong Kong, I would call them back forces in Hong Kong, want to force Beijing's hands. These are not negotiators. They do not want a negotiated outcome. And very often, they paint themselves into a corner, and they paint Hong Kong into a corner. The 2014 Umbrella Movement was a result of the constitutional reform that could have led to 
a one-man, one-vote election of chief, chief executive. But they, then, as now, they want to have Zhang Poshi, a genuine universal suffrage, meaning they want to cast the basic law aside, they want to cast this aside. They do not want nomination committee nominations of candidates, and they want civic nomination, open nomination of candidates. That's not under basic law. And they did not want to negotiate. Somehow they thought that bringing out the masses, uh, we have 100,000 people in the streets. Why don't you agree? And that's not politics. And that's not diplomacy. That's not internal diplomacy. The sooner we learn, the better for Hong Kong. Yeah, on the veranda, if you could bring a microphone. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Alexandra Stevenson, New York Times. Um, I just, a request, could you move the microphone a little closer? It's hard for us back here to hear you. Um, my, my question to you is, um, what is your reaction to uh, the decision this morning or overnight by President Trump to sign the um, Hong Kong democracy legislation? And second, um, what do you think, it, what kind of impact do you think it will have on relations between the United States, Hong Kong, and China? I, I, I don't think the, the congressman who voted for this act were fully informed or correctly informed. As I said, even uh, Nancy Pelosi being um, Speaker of the House, um, I just can't imagine how could someone of her seniority on a matter as important as this could have said on record that Hong Kong should have been given uh, a full, full autonomy, and China denied it. Um, and I don't think whoever initiated this, be they American or Hong Kong uh, people, ever had the interest of Hong Kong in mind. It's a proxy thing. I don't think they, they have Hong Kong's freedoms, Hong Kong's democracy, and Hong Kong's human rights in mind. It's all about China. Um, yeah, right over here. So, thank you for your comments. I think the question... Oh, can you identify yourself? Sorry, please? Malcolm Brocklebank. The question that many of us would like to ask is what would you have done as chief executive over the past few months? But that's hypothetical and I wouldn't ask. But. <laughs> If you were on an advisory panel to the current CE, what suggestions would you put up for discussion as to how to resolve the situations? Um, Thank you. It wouldn't be fair for me to make the sort of comparison and give you an answer to the hypo hypothetical question um, because I'm not on the inside now. I do not have all the, the facts uh, and the analysis that governments um, have um, to back up anything I, I, I say. And as a matter of principle, I don't comment on the work of, um, of the present government. Um, going forward, I think the key thing, again, is for the Hong Kong people, and by extension, their foreign supporters, to have an honest and full understanding of this book. Um, anything, this, this law has been passed for 29 years now. It's a bit pardon, at least 29 years, so it's passed in uh, 1990. It's been enforced for 22. Um, and China has never amended it. To them, it's more or less the Bible. It's extremely difficult for anyone in the Chinese government or in the Chinese authorities to convince the rest of the country that from here on we should have different provisions or we should have amended provisions in the basic law. Believe it or not, as I uh, said in my speech, they actually went up and down the country in the five year drafting and constitution period to ask the mainland people and the mainland government what they thought about uh, the two drafts. Um, 
So I think it's extremely uh, senseless and irresponsible and irresponsible for political figures in Hong Kong and outside Hong Kong to think that somehow by bringing hundreds and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets of Hong Kong, somehow China's hand could be forced so that we could have full autonomy in Hong Kong without China's uh, involvement. Uh, that we could have a local democracy that has all the hallmarks of a sovereign democracy. Um, yeah, over here. Yeah, thank you. And this will need to be our last question. We um, we want to get you out of here. Then we want to get the former chief executive out of here on time. So thank you. Um, Katrina Hamlin, Reuters Breaking Views. You spoke with great admiration of the economic reforms in China. To what extent do you think Hong Kong's economic problems are part of the cause of the crisis in Hong Kong today? And to what extent do you think they should be part of the solution? Um, even without the past six months of disturbances, I think we have problems with our economy with the structure of our economy uh, and with the di distribution of uh, the fruits of our economic activities. I think we should sit back and take this opportunity for all of us, including the business sector, to reflect on whether we have a sustainable, politically sustainable system. We ask the disgruntled young people out there, they would be first to, to deny that economic and livelihood issues such as housing problems have anything to do with this. I mean, they're all going for democracy, freedoms, um, and some of them want to, to break away from uh, China. And they, they would deny it. Be that as it may, let's not look at the past six months. Let's look at our future and ask ourselves, do we have a sustainable system in Hong Kong. All level economics, production, distribution. Do we have a sustainable structure on the production side? Do we have a sustainable, politically sustainable uh, structure on the distribution side? I can recognize all the benefits or the great things about laissez-faire economy and the free economy and minimum government intervention and so on and so forth, but up to a point. Um, so my, my um, short answer uh, to your question is, yes, I think it's one of the things that we should look at and we should take a long and hard look at. Thank you. Well, we could be here all, all afternoon, but we do want to uh, respect everyone's time. So please join me. I'm going to give our, our guest a um, little gift as he's giving Thank us you. a gift. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>